Chinesa, yes, trooper, was tragically killed in action in Kabul on Friday night our time. I also use this opportunity to formally release his name. It is therefore my sad duty to advise you that SAS uh, trooper Corporal Doug Grant, Dougie Grant, paid the ultimate price and died trying to free hospitals on Friday night. He was 41 years old and was from Linton. He leaves behind a loving wife and two young children, a daughter aged seven and a son aged five, as well as his wider family. His own family, his SAS and Army families, and all of those in the Defence Force deeply feel the loss of this man. On behalf of the Defence Force, I extend my heartfelt condolences to his family. Before moving on, I'm aware that some media had identified his name yesterday, and I wish to extend to them my thanks for respecting his family's request for space and privacy during this most difficult time. I'd now like to tell you a little bit more about the circumstances in which Corporal Grant died. The British Council Office was the target of, uh, of the terrorist <coughs> raid. As you're all aware, um, this was the anniversary of the independence of Afghanistan from British rule. There had been some alert um, uh, warnings about a possible raid, and therefore most of the city and the counter-terrorists, as well as the policing and uh, wider military units were on standby for some action to occur. There was no warning of what the target was, though. The British Council Office was the target of an assault. Most of the media reporting over the last few days on the incident has been accurate and it is not my intention to go into more details of the wider operation. What I will be talking about though is the operation in which our SAS were engaged, the specifics of those tasks, and in particular how Dougie Grant died. For those who uh, wish, this is a Getty image and it's been in the, um, uh, the Herald. This is Dougie Grant. And so, uh, there is the footage of him entering the operation. In a wider picture, um, the area that we were focusing on here. This is the compound. Uh, this is the main building in which the terrorists were holding up. Uh, the crisis response unit, the Afghan crisis response unit, was given the responsibility of attacking and killing uh, the insurgents that were holding up in here. There were some UK nationals as well as some security staff that were still in the building. Once the operation had been underway for a while, it was realised that the Afghan forces needed to focus on countering the uh, terrorists, and so our SAS were given the task of rescuing the hostages, of rescuing the civilians who were still in the building. So our SAS strike team was focusing on getting those people out of the building. Dougie Grant was involved in the group that uh, was doing this task, and there were two major locations for our team. First of all, a, uh, the strike group that was going to go into the building to rescue our people out was positioned around here, close to the building, but there was overwatch in terms of coordinating fire from a higher point in this area. Dougie Grant had moved back to the site uh, to get better situational awareness uh, into the high ground to see, to provide further information to those teams that were going in. This is the site that uh, he was killed on. He climbed up onto the roof of the building and was in this location observing the enemy when he was struck by an enemy now. There has been some uh, media speculation about what he was shot with, uh, and often the term of a 50 caliber has been used. He was shot, as we know, by a rifle or a light machine gun round, so probably 7.62. Just for further information, if a 50 caliber round had killed him, it would have uh, probably torn apart his body. This was a rifle or a light machine gun round. He was then evacuated uh, by the medics um, through the hole, uh, withdrawn from that area through the hole and evacuated out into the street. There was also a little bit of speculation about uh, when he died. In hindsight, we now know that he probably would never have recovered from those injuries. They were uh, terminal. But as he was evacuated out, the medics who were with him were able to discern a pulse. At least once during the evacuation, he lost his pulse and was resuscitated. But when he was being placed on the helicopter, um, our understanding was that he still had a pulse. When he arrived at the Bagram Military Hospital, though, um, they had ceased to give him care as he had died en route. Where the speculation about whether he died on site or on the route is probably when they first lost a pulse, there was a discussion about whether the medical evacuation should be cancelled, uh, 
uh, our guys who were adamant that we still had a pulse um, insisted that the evacuation continue. But that's where the first reporting of him being killed in action came from. But our understanding and uh, our medics state that they were pretty certain that they were reviving him and still had a pulse. And at that stage where they weren't able to verify exactly what the injuries were, uh, their intention was to try and evacuate him back to a hospital. I think it does credit that um, our special forces and our military have world-class medics, and therefore the amount of support immediately at the time of his injury and throughout was world-class. And the hospital here is going back to Bagram again as a world-class hospital with amazing facilities that if there was a chance to revive him, uh, that was his best chance. Probably at this stage it's useful for me to uh, talk about uh, the body armour is again there's been speculation uh, about uh, whether the body armour was uh, effective or not. It can be confirmed that um, Dougie Grant was killed by a bullet entering the side through his armpits, going through his body and uh, through his heart and out the other side. One of the realities about modern uh, battlefield uh, protection equipment is that there's nothing we can do to protect, the, uh, ultimately protect someone. The body armour that we use is designed to protect the vital organs as much as we can. But the reality is because of the functionality that they need, mobility they need over the battlefield, it's impossible for us to fully protect someone. And so this armour is designed to protect the heart from most uh, directions and the vital organs in the, in the torso of the body. You will note that there is protection to the side, uh, over the shoulder, as well as protection under here as much as possible. But with the range of movements you need to climb uh, to fire a weapon, there, there are some spaces where weapons can go through. After this, you'll get a chance to pick up and feel how heavy it is and understand that to actually get more comprehensive body armor, you'll severely restrict your ability to actually operate on the battlefield and they'll become more vulnerable by not being able to move, not being able to climb, not being able to take a fire position. This is not the exact model that the Special Forces use. They have a, a slightly upgraded version, which is more able for them to move, but it actually uh, shows the same layout that uh, the Arana uh, has. So from the start, we are confident that the equipment that we have, in terms of the personal protection gear, the body armor, the helmets, uh, the other protection systems that we have for our people are top world class. Uh, it was just the reality of the battlefield environment that he was caught by someone flying from his side and uh, went through the bullets in his heart on the way out. I'll now move on to um, Corporal Grant and his history in the uh, Defence Force as well as the Special Forces. Corporal Grant was a long serving member of the Defence Force, 21 years and extensive experience. He spent a third of his career as an instrument in the New Zealand Army and a further third with the Royal New Zealand Engineers. <coughs> the remainder was with the SAS, and this was the year where he actually had the most personal identity with. He had extensive operational experience, two tours in East Timor, one in the former Yugoslavia, as well as a previous tour in Afghanistan. It was the second uh, deployment to Afghanistan with the SAS, and he had only just recently returned to Afghanistan with a rotation. The SES, as we all know, is one of our premier combat units, probably the premier combat unit that we have, and is certainly world class, as shown by the operations in Afghanistan over the last few months. It requires extreme mental and physical ability and stamina to make the grade. Only about 10 to 15 percent of all those who apply to join the SES go all the way through the recruitment and training process. The work is always dangerous, and they're brave men who do their best to serve New Zealand and do their best to accomplish the mission. They are an extremely tight-knit group, and because of the nature of what they do, they're grieving, but they also have enormous um, uh, self-discipline and uh, self-confidence in each other. Their very tightness and the special tactics they use, of course, do mean that uh, they need to be a group that's kept private and kept away from the public eye. The tactics and techniques they use and try and um, keep uh, out of the public eye because we don't want terrorists or their opponents being able to learn from their own tactics. And as we've seen in the tactics in Afghanistan by the terrorist groups, they do watch and they do observe. So we need to be vigilant that um, any uh, advantage that they can gain out of media release needs to be minimised. 
Doug served in the SAS as well as the engineers and infantry with pride and commitment. He was widely regarded as a competent and uh, likable person in the SAS, and as I mentioned before, he saw this as his identity. He had left the unit and gone down to uh, Linton, where his uh, family currently are, but uh, he, he eventually decided that he wanted to go back into the unit because that's how he saw himself, as being an SAS soldier from the start. Along with the Prime Minister uh, and the Minister of Defence, I visited his family on Saturday to express our heartfelt sympathy. I've made a commitment to, the, to them that we will do everything we can to care for and support them throughout this time and beyond. The family have made a media statement, and I'll be sending it out uh, to you after this, and I'll now read the statement from the family. The family wish to acknowledge and express their appreciation for the support they have received from the New Zealand Army. Doug had a wide group of friends from all walks of life. The support and love from all these people has been humbling. Some might wonder why Doug went into harm's way. Doug had absolute faith in his friends and colleagues and what he was doing in Afghanistan. He understood what he was getting into and believed in the goal of training local forces for that country's future. He was a determined person, some might say stubborn in his pursuit of his goals while growing up. He wrote in a school essay once that he wanted to be in the SAS. He went towards that goal from, the, from that time onwards and convinced the army he could do the job. Like most Kiwis, Doug did not make a big deal about his achievements. He shied away from the spotlight, preferring to focus his attentions on his family and getting whatever job he tackled done to the best of his considerable abilities, whether it was building a house, being a soldier, or being a husband and father. The family is incredibly proud of Doug's achievement as a soldier and as a husband, father, brother and son. Doug was adamant in his determination to keep his work life separate from his family life, and we appreciate that while he is now the focus of our country, that the media give Tina and the children some private space to come to terms with the fact that he died doing one of the things he loved. <coughs> the family have requested that Corporal Grant be brought home as quickly as possible. He is therefore returning home on a commercial flight. Just be aware this is slightly different to the information we gave out in our first brief where there was still uh, speculation and options about how he might be brought home. We'll keep you advised on the details of the repatriation and funeral arrangements once these have been confirmed. At this stage it's proposed to hold a private commemoration for him in Auckland uh, and then he'll be transferred in a more formal ceremony down to Linton Military Camp where he will lie in state for a few days. This will be followed by a service at Linton Camp, again the date to be advised, but please note that the service itself will be closed to the media. We're working with the family to make the arrangements in accordance with their wishes, and our goal from the very start, as it is now, is to ensure that the family is supported and their wishes are met. To conclude, this is the reality of military life. Every soldier, sailor and airman knows the dangers which they will go into, be it in the air, at sea or on land. The reality of military life is also that those who are left behind need to close ranks and move on, need to have the hard, steady face to <coughs> continue to face the tasks and the difficulties that we have. I wish to give my thanks to those people in Afghanistan who remain on duty. I also wish to give my thanks to those people who have rallied around his family and have been with Tina uh, right from the start. And I also wish to give my uh, greater condolences to his family, to those who were his friends, and to those who are his comrades who are still here. I now ask the Minister to make it clear. Thank you. As Minister of Defence, I wish to pay my personal condolences to Corporal Douglas Grant and his family. Uh, as a Member of Parliament and as Minister of Defence, uh, I am conscious that Whenever young New Zealanders are deployed overseas, that this is the risk that we ask them to take. And on this particular occasion, the highest price has been paid, and fundamentally it is actually paid by his family. So my condolences go particularly to his family. But as, as you've heard from General Jones, our Defence Force, our SAS in particular are resourceful, they're resilient, and they're
by resolute. And they will carry out our nation's tasks that we set for them. On this particular occasion, Corporal Grant was actually protecting and saving lives of um, the British Council people. And for that, I believe we should be elected. Thank you, Minister. I'll now give the opportunity for questions. The ECS were um, uh, the crisis response unit was deployed uh, to support or to take on the role of, um, of entering the building and killing the uh, terrorists or, or neutralising the terrorists. Initially, a, uh, a British regular unit had deployed to cordon off the area. The crisis response unit, with our mentoring team with them, was deployed in. Once uh, it was identified that it was going to be quite a complex attack, it was a very hardened building. Then our team were brought in because of the division of responsibilities. Uh, whereas the crisis response unit was focused on the terrorists, the need of another group, another group, to be able to rescue out uh, those civilians who were still in there. So it was quite some time after the initial deployment that our team was assigned its task and we So it wasn't really the big point to No, we had a subsidiary mission to get the, um, the civilians out, the, the, the exact number we weren't sure of. Whereas the lead was the crisis response unit that was focused on the terrorists. Who makes that decision? The local commander uh, on the spot, which was an outcome. Yeah, so, how do you respond to criticism then that, um, that the ECS is It's always been identified that the uh, mentoring and training role for the crisis response unit would involve them going with them on operations, but the lead uh, for them uh, is gradually being handed over to the crisis response unit. So it had always been mentioned uh, quite a while ago, John Key made the comment that we had to eat their lunch, they actually really shouldering those responsibilities. But in terms of mentoring uh, and leading what they do, is they train them uh, how to do it and they're training back in their uh, base camp. But on operations, I'll go with them and support uh, the Afghani commanders and their decision making for providing advice to it as the Afghanis are taking the, the bulk of the operational work the firefighters through. There are still occasions where there is a difference where um, if we leave them to it, it will take a lot longer to complete the missions. They are certainly um, not near the standard of our own ECS. And therefore, in order to speed up to reduce casualties, there is always the desire. There's always the ability for us to step in and help rather than uh, it being bogged down and risk further casualties to civilians and vice versa or other side. And that's always been an understanding of what we're saying. But the prime role is to train and then go with them to assist them. Is the role becoming more dangerous as the Taliban gets closer to the Afghanistan is always a dangerous place. Place, uh, and always has been. The, the tactics really brings back into the spotlight uh, the Kabul and the spectacular events that uh, we've seen over this last year. So those tactics do bring uh, the need to have uh, the crisis response unit up to a high level. Uh, it does possibly accentuate the fact that we are right in the very uh, centre of attention in here. But it also shows that high quality, world class units like our SPS are what's needed. Yes, other people could do those jobs, but the fact that we are one of the best in the world means that we can be relied upon the experience and the training that has been given to the Afghanis is going to be the best for us available. And the prime focus is training up that crisis response unit to do the task. This operation, as well as the ones over the last month, have shown that they are stepping up quite well. Um, as they become more proficient, the probability and likelihood of us being directly engaged will drop off. Um, but the uh, terrorists will continue to adapt and change their tactics. And so we need to continue to have the, uh, the possibility of our forces being deployed in there as unusual things will occur. But again, that comes back to the emphasis that we want to minimise the knowledge of our tactics and techniques and procedures. Uh, we want to keep one step ahead of them as we can. And we will have any quality units like the SDS available uh, to the ISAF and the Afghan government. Can you speak about the bullets that killed Corporal Grant came from insurgents? And it was he one of the insurgents who was killed by the CIU? Yes. 
Did you know? Um, I had, I probably had met him. I did not know him uh, individually. I had met his wife uh, before as well, uh, when she was a medic. But uh, no, I, I did not know Doug. Uh, she still serves in the army and stuff like What does she do? Um, she is in the education corps. Uh, previously medic, but uh, in the education um, 41 years of age, two young kids. Is, is there any indication that this would be his last deployment? Had he, had he thought this would on to anything else? He had uh, moved out of the SES um, on the reality that his um, focus on his family, um, but that uh, he was in the SES with his young kids. But he, there had been a lot of discussion in his family about him wanting to go back into the SES. So he had asked to come back into the unit, knowing that uh, the probability of further deployments was on the card. So they had made the family decision to move into the back of the SES and come to the understanding that this would not be. How would you describe the event? Oh, um, the terrorist tactics are changing from uh, from a broad insurgency across the population to a more high uh, visibility, uh, more spectacular uh, events. We consider the reason for this is they were losing uh, the battle out in the countryside. Their leadership had been stripped out by the tactics we were using, uh, the concept of operations that go to target insurgency, which is isolating the people from the insurgents taking away their logistic and their command skills. They've had to change their tactics to focus more on high spectacular events, more targeted at the media profile this has outside Afghanistan. Their target, very similar to insurgents in the past, is to add out the populations of those people who are serving or those countries that are serving in Afghanistan, to remove the confidence that the ISAF forces, the Afghanis, are starting to regain control of their own countries. At, at this stage, while we're still going through our operational people, it's too little to tell. Uh, but all of the circumstances that are under fire bravery, they are under fire, as you can see. And so the, the level of, uh, of engagement, the level of danger, it's highly likely that um, it's some citations on recommendations will come, but we're still at the end stage. Will he be replaced in the uh, His replacement is uh, has already underway. Yeah. Is there any need to review the withdrawal date of this April? No, there is not. Uh, when we deploy our soldiers overseas, we intend to carry out our missions. And uh, as the Prime Minister said on Saturday, New Zealanders don't cut them. So our deployment is through to March next year. The Prime Minister has also been very clear on that. Uh, we have no intention to extend that deployment. They will have been there, in fact, two and a half years at that point, relatively small unit, and uh, it is really time for them to regroup. And of course, as General Jones has indicated, we are there to actually build the capacity of the Afghan government. They, at the end of the day, are going to be responsible for their security and that we're in, essentially in that process of transition now. Transition really is taking place from now through to 2014. And um, certainly all the briefings I've had would indicate that the crisis response unit is building its capability all the time. Uh, and uh, that was evident on this mission. We've had both General Jones and myself and the Prime Minister have had that direct statement from the Director of Special have you sought any assurances that, in fact, by leaving a reduced force, you have increased the dangers that are going to That's probably taken a lot The smaller size forces that we have here can still do the prime job, which is to train and support the crisis response unit. Um, they are able to, the, the reduction mainly uh, reduces the ability to do um, consecutive or sequential operations, uh, where we're doing two or more. Succession to each other. So, in terms of reducing the ability to do the role, no, uh, the forces there are adequate to continue the training and focus on the crisis as well. 
No, the um, crisis response unit was out of focus. Um, <clears throat> about 100 people were engaged in this operation. Most of those in the court or support troops going outside medical support communications. The strike unit out of the crisis response unit uh, um, was focused on the terrorists and, and going through into the building. And our small team was uh, designed to do a particular mission or could have taken on uh, a small specific task should the situation be free to go but uh, focusing on getting those civilians out of the building was uh, an appropriate task for the United States. Is it your expectation that another commander could maintain my gun and that he's in this role for the CIA to make the next year? Yes, the crisis response unit still needs moving to further enhance their capability. Uh, every force, uh, even our own force, trains with other uh, militaries, overseas, other special forces to raise capability. And so the partnering of the crisis is sponsored to continue. And just in terms of the repatriation of the <coughs> um, my understanding when uh, the defendant of O'Donnell was repatriated, there was problems bringing him back to the country and a memorandum of understanding with the curve between customs, MAC, and the Defence Force. Is that something you're anticipating this time? Uh, yes, the, um, uh, this is now the third uh, person we brought back out of Afghanistan, and so our process is at least well uh, known to bring it back into the country. The exact mechanism of how to bring it back and the time that takes is the detail that we've through about availability of military flights, uh, availability of support. Uh, but in this particular case, bringing him back uh, at the earliest opportunity was the family's desires and that narrowed us down into uh, a civilian minor. And of course, um, the bringing back of bodies through the civilian system is uh, a little more uh, machine. <coughs> Not in the boat. He was not the only one up in the area. There are other people who provided the overwatch. So the only thing say is no. He was, there are other people up there providing overwatch, as well as the uh, a medical personnel. I can also emphasise uh, again there was um, the crisis response unit for the Afghan unit also had one person killed uh, in the building and one other seriously injured, as well as eight white men as well. So those were um, uh, extremely forced casualties that occurred. Four terrorists were killed in the building, and probably another two uh, who were in the uh, uh, vehicle that blasted its way in there, and there were a number of other casualties. At this stage, I have no further information over the top of you about the other Do you know how many civilians they rescued Three British and two uh, Gurkha security guards. That's a question for Dr. Maxwell. Um, I know you said that the SAS had come back and regrouped. The Prime Minister has made it very clear uh, that the deployment is through to March. That you can't rule out that they might go back after? Well, the Prime Minister has made it very clear that the deployment is through to March. What do you do for the family? You, you were saying earlier that um, you know, you're looking after the family. Obviously, you visited the family and expressed condolences and maybe looking after the future, that sort of thing. Um, well, let me just get through what they do uh, from the immediate crisis, probably useful for information from the um, <coughs> um, We will always notify the family ourselves rather than the uh, police. Group. And uh, those people who go and notify the family will remain with them uh, for the next week or up until the time of the service. And as, as far beyond that as the family wishes. Uh, so we have people um, from Linton Camp, but also the special forces uh, with the family to provide the support in the liaison. So they are there to talk through what we've talked to them through here. This is what happened when we were doing. This is what's going to occur. There's information about the repatriation. Uh, a lot of the friends out of Linton Camp are also with the personal friends of Tina, uh, the wife as well as uh, friends of Dougie, that have come through and provided constant support for them. What we provide is, I suppose, certainty and reliability. Um, uh, and the 
and the surety's driven time when they are focusing on themselves, their grief means that they can make a lot of decisions. And so that support we provide um, and in terms of tuning the military machine on to provide the ceremonial support for evacuation. Take away from the family all the burdens about organising the funeral, about what happens afterwards. Uh, those are the things we provide in the need support. In the longer term, we provide, uh, it depends on the family circumstances and what they want to do. In this particular case, we're 10 years in the military. Uh, the ongoing support uh, for the Bakushi will remain part of the military community. It will always be there for them. She will get, um, uh, there are some compensatory payments, insurance payments that the Defence Force uh, underwrites and pays for that, um, as well as the support if they then choose to uh, leave or shift or move to any benefits or that support screen, but, um, still is entitled to both. Any more questions? So once again, thank you for uh, uh, coming in today. And once again, I do really thank you for giving the family space. Uh, uh, it is not easy for, uh, for a family to do time, but I do appreciate that space you've given. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This is the, the only media comment we're making today from the CDM.